Okay, so I make it uh, 2.55, which means that uh, we are uh, due our next presentation. So I hope you've all been able to get yourselves a tea or coffee or whatever beverage took your fancy. Um, so without further ado, then I'm delighted to announce our next speaker, uh, Kit Yates from University of Bath. Um, Kit, I think you're ready to go and you're going to be talking to us about misinformation and epidemics. Absolutely. Thanks. Hopefully you can all hear me OK. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the very kind introduction. Thanks for the invitation uh, from Ed and thanks to the organisers for putting together what is seemingly turning out to be a really interesting um, workshop. Um, yeah, I'm, my name is Kit Yates. I'm um, a senior lecturer in mathematical biology at the University of Bath. I'm also the co-director of the Centre for Biology, uh, Mathematical Biology there. And uh, the caveat that I often have to put in front of things at the moment is I'm also a member of independent sage for my sins. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit, little bit about um, some of the epidemiological modelling work that we've been doing over the last year on uh, understanding how information or misinformation can change the dynamics of an epidemic. So I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit about my group, which is called the Developmental Mathematical Biology Group at the University of Bath. And then I'll talk more about the actual work that I've been invited to talk about. Um, so firstly, the group, it's called the Mathematical Developmental Biology Group because that's what we do. We're not primarily an epidemiological group. So that's the caveat in front of this talk. We are, you know, we, we teach mathematical epidemiology to undergraduates, but this is not our primary research area of expertise. So we've worked on areas from the migration of locusts and how they swarm and how we can control those swarms. We've looked at the way that bacteria spread, spread and swim and form colonies and tried to understand that and we have done a little bit of work latterly on coronavirus we've looked at the way animal pigmentation patterns forms this is a zebrafish pigmentation pattern model we also model mammalian pigmentation patterns because we're interested in patterns we've developed some tools which allow us to um, which allow us to uh, characterize patterns so this thing's called pair correlation function we've looked at modeling the way that um, cells proliferate and modeling the cell cycle and actually we've borrowed a trick from epidemiology called the linear chain trick where you can change an exponentially distributed waiting time into a gamma or Erlang distributed waiting time um, which is useful for changing the infectious period distribution in epidemiological models and because we do a lot of stochastic simulation we've done a lot of work on trying to develop more efficient stochastic simulation models as well. So this is just to, to caveat the fact that, you know, we do do some epidemiological modeling, but that's not our primary interest. And um, back when the pandemic was sort of kicking off back in early 2020, I read this really interesting article by uh, Julia, who I think is on, on the call, um, which was about how you can help with COVID-19 modeling if you're a mathematical modeler. And her advice was rather than adding to the noise, you should amplify the signal. And I think what she meant by that was, uh, don't go out and build your own mathematical models and get it sent to peer review and take up all the peer reviewing time. Actually go out there and, and tell people how difficult it is to create mathematical models, what the models do, you know, what we're doing when we're trying to explore control measures and the challenges of synthesizing data in real time. And so to a large degree, my sort of um, epidemiological work has been focused around doing that over the last year talking to the public, talking to the media about mathematical modeling, how it works and why people are having to undergo these restrictions and why we believe that the models will, um, the, the, the predictions or the projections that the models are making. That said, I have now gone and broken that rule and we have written a paper about mathematical epidemiology. So sorry, Julia, um, but hopefully now things have calmed down a little bit and um, and it's not, not too much of a sin to do this now. So this is, um, the paper is at the bottom here, it's called Misinformation Can Prevent Suppression of Epidemics, and it's joint work with a PhD student of mine, Andre Sontag, and a, a colleague of mine at the University of Bath, Tim Rogers. So um, I think non-pharmaceutical interventions like mask wearing, social distancing are important tools to tackle the spread of an epidemic at the early stages, particularly an emerging epidemic like coronavirus. And they can be used to slow down or even if implemented um, appropriately and strictly adhered to, to suppress an epidemic, even the absence of pharmaceutical interventions like treatments and vaccines. So in the past, we've uh, models have examined the interplay between risk perception models, information spreading uh, process behavior and epidemic dynamics. 
And these models have typically considered a homogeneous population. And actually what we're interested in now is, is thinking about a, two different types of population, um, people who trust the information and people who don't trust the information. So, um, you know, to some degree, the, the effectiveness of things like social distancing strategies, mask wearing and so on depends on the behaviours of individuals, how conscientiously they follow the advice that's given and how successfully they encourage other people to do the same. So as an example, I wanted to share a story about exponential growth bias. So this is where people fail to understand exponential growth properly. Um, so typically it's failure to estimate how quickly things can get out of hand when things are growing exponentially, like at the start of an epidemic. Um, so the inability to correctly recognize and interpret exponential growth has been shown to act as a significant impediment for governments to get people to follow strat infection control strategies. So there's a study from 2020 which found that if you have a higher exponential growth bias, that's uh, associated with lower levels of compliance with anti-COVID measures um, like social distancing, like face covers and so on. And people who are unable to estimate uh, accurately the spread of the speed of the spread of the disease are less likely to see the importance of disease, disease control mitigations and hence less likely to implement and observe them. And I think that actually President Trump might have been a high profile case in point for this. He placed at the start of the epidemic or the start of the pandemic huge emphasis on the low case levels in the United States, playing down how serious it was, not, not apparently recognising how uh, quickly these numbers could take off. And consequently, his administration continually downplayed the seriousness of the situation, which led to reluctance to implement the measures that were necessary to suppress or control the disease. So Trump tweeted uh, this in, on the 9th of March. He said 37,000 Americans died from flu, um, last year, it averages between 27 and 70,000 a year. Nothing's shut down. Life in the economy go on. At this moment, there are 456 confirmed coronavirus cases, so cases with 22 deaths. Think about that. So suggesting that the numbers were very low and would probably remain very low. So quite apart from the fact that the figures that Trump has quoted there are, are massive overestimates for flu deaths, the CDC suggests that actually it's between 12 and 16,000 people on average every year, rather than the high figures that he's quoted. Um, but the US, uh, you know, the figures that he quotes are roughly right for cases and deaths. Um, but by the end of his presidency on the 20th of January the next year, there had been 24 and a half million cases and 400,000 deaths, which dwarfed even his you know, overinflated flu figures. So it's an example of how people's behavior, people's understanding of the information can change the way that an epidemic can go. And it's particularly acute when that person that's misunderstanding the information is the president of, uh, of one of the biggest nations in the world. Um, so let me tell you about the model that we've constructed to try and understand this. We are assuming a fixed population size. We're assuming SIR dynamics for disease spread. So susceptible people, and I'm going to show a couple of images later, are going to be represented by this sort of stick figure, infectious people by this coronavirus, and uh, recovered people by this shield with a tick in it. Uh, and they're going to be two subpopulations of people. So apart from the fact they're going to be divided into susceptible, infected, and removed or recovered, we're going to have trusting individuals. So these are people who actively seek out good quality information and distrusting individuals. And so these are people who actively seek out quality information. So how does it work? How does the information model, uh, information spread model work? So we've got these two uh, subpopulations, trusting individuals with index T and distrusting individuals with index D. And um, the, uh, when we have uh, two people meeting up then they can change their uh, quality of information. So here, zero is the best quality of information and, and well it goes much higher than six but infinity is the worst quality so the higher the level the worse the quality of information um so trusting individuals update their information when they encounter individuals with a better quality of information uh, and information loses quality when it gets passed so here's a trusting individual meeting with an individual another individual of any type doesn't matter trusting or distrusting they take on their information level, so three, but every time information passes, it degrades by one level because you're further away from the source of the information. So actually they end up taking on, on information level four because they interacted with someone level three. 
So that's a trusting individual. A distrusting individual, if they interact with someone with worse quality information than themselves, then they will take on that worse quality of information. So they would go to level three, but again, there's a degradation of information as it passes. So they also uh, go up a level to level four. Uh, if trusting individuals meet people with worse quality information, then they ignore them. And similarly, if distrusting individuals meet people with better quality information, then they ignore them as well. Um, so that's the effective dynamics of what's going on. Uh, to represent that uh, using symbols, this top line here represents a trusting individual at information level I meeting another individual with better information level J. So the individual, it doesn't matter what type they are, distrusting or trusting, so it's represented with a Y here. They meet with uh, rate alpha T, and then uh, the, the trusting individual takes on information level J, where J is less than I, but it degrades, so they go to level J plus one, and the other individual stays the same. And then this is um, the distrusting individual meeting someone with uh, worse quality information than them. So J, where J is greater than I here, they meet with rate alpha D and the distrusting individual takes on the worse information at level J and uh, again, it degrades. So they go to level J plus one and the original individual stays the same. And then we also uh, account for sort of memory loss in this process. Um, so the idea being that if there's no disease in the population, we would like people to forget what's what's happening and, and not to worry about information. So information fades uh, with rate lambda for everybody in the population. So it means that if the disease dies out, then people start to forget about it. OK, um, so that's the model. We can write down uh, ordinary differential equations to describe this. Again, this looks complicated. Don't worry too much about it. It's in the paper, but I'll just describe uh, the rate of change of trusting and distrusting individuals at level K. So this is just the information spread dynamics. So this first term is trusting individuals updating their information when they encounter someone with better quality of information. So we sum over all the other individuals at level zero to K minus two. Uh, so they can leave that state K by, by uh, getting better quality information. Or we can have individuals at a level K um uh, at any level which is higher than k here meeting with individuals at level k minus one and entering information state k uh, and then we have the fading and refreshing so these are the the four uh, different components and then this is the very basically the same thing for distrusting individuals the only difference is that the indices on these sums are basically swapped over so this time you lose distrusting individuals when they meet some with worse quality information and you gain distrusting individuals from a uh, from a lower quality information or sorry, better, better quality information state um, when they meet with individuals at level k minus one and then we have the fading uh, and and um, fading into that state so those that's the sort of uh, the equations for the information dynamics how does that interface with uh, the the sir disease spread model that i talked about before well we assume that disease transmission is reduced by informed individuals the better informed individuals are the lower the transmissibility should be so this is implemented by multiplying the transmissibility the rate of transmission uh, by this factor one minus rho to the i times one minus rho to the j where i is the information level of the susceptible individual and j is the information level of the um, of the infected individual and that's the rate at which susceptible people get turned into infected individuals um, so that's the, the main link, but there's also a second link between behavior and disease, which is given by this information refreshing effect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so infected individuals uh, here refresh their information index from any value that they're currently at down to zero because they know that they've got the disease. And so ideally, uh, they won't be going out. So if they refresh to information level zero, then that means that this factor in the transmiss transmissibility should become zero as well. Uh, and again, then their, their information can fade uh, as they leave the infected state, um, or and it can just it fades over time with rate lambda. Um, so this delay, the fact that they don't immediately go to level zero, um, they just go with rate omega accounts for the fact that we do have, um, uh, for example, we have asymptomatic periods of infection, people that don't realize they're infected, maybe people who think maybe they've got a cold instead of COVID or whatever, whatever it may be. So you don't immediately um, go to information level zero as soon as you become infected, but you do do that with rate omega. 
So again, these are the equations which correspond to this. Again, it's, there's two slides of it. I only put it up here just to scare you or to, to show you that we did do some maths. Um, but don't worry too much about it. I'll, I'll describe one of the equations, but not the rest. So this is the, the sort of full model. We've got categories for uh, susceptible and infected, trusting and distrusting, and then information level K. So that's what these subscripts mean. So these are the susceptible ones. We've got uh, infected at level zero, they've got their own equations. And then we've got infected at level K, trusting and distrusting, and recovered at level K, trusting and distrusting. So for the susceptible population, um, you, you leave the state of being susceptible by getting infected. So this is the, the new infection uh, or the new transmissibility. Um, you have to sum over all the possible infectious classes um, of, of either type trusting or distrusting. That's how people get infected. So that's the sort of um, the disease transmission dynamics and the rest of it is, is information transmission. So this is how you leave uh, level K by interacting with someone with better quality information if you're a trusting individual information can fade, you can, uh, someone from level K minus one can fade into level K, uh, or you can gain people, susceptible people, uh, from, um, from a higher or a worse quality information state by interacting with anyone else who's got state K. So we saw those sorts of terms before. So that's, that's the whole, the whole model. It is quite complicated. It's, you know, there's these six different classes of susceptibles and, and, uh, infected, trusting and distrusting. Uh, and of course, then there's all these different levels K, which potentially go from zero through to infinity, although in practice, we, we cut that off at a particular time. Um, so I won't say too much about this. I'll just to tell you about the results, what happens when we simulate this, um, because, well, we can do some analytical stuff later, but firstly, we'll talk about simulating. So this first figure, uh, this is looking at infected population curves over time, so times on the x-axis. And the first figure, it's not, it's not exactly a result, but it helps to understand what's happening in the system later on. So we show aggregated infection, infected population curves. So all the infected people from different classes um, with uh, all the different values of information mediated protection here. So that's row varying here, or with different proportions of um, uh, distrusting people in the population. So that's D. So what you can see is that for, for low, values of rho, so low um, in information mediated suppression, then um, you can get um, outbreaks, you can get the disease taking off. Um, so if the population is completely unaware at the start of the, uh, yeah, the other thing I should say is at the start of the population, when the population is completely unaware, what you tend to see is that there's initial phase of, of sort of free infection, all the curves follow the same trajectory. The information dynamics actually doesn't have a big impact there because no one knows they're infected yet. Um, and so all the curves follow the same behavior. But as the number of cases increases, the number of infected individuals realize that they're infected, then the awareness generated uh, by that starts, means that people start to take precautionary measures and reduce transmission. So for higher values of rho, you can see, that, so that's higher protective measures, um, you can observe a reduced number of infections in the population, and you can see a similar effect here for a lower density of distrusting individuals, you see um, lower numbers of infections in the, in the population. A second key point to note is that there's um, a value of rho and the distrusting population density for which the infected population becomes almost constant. So these blue curves here, um, you're sort of entering a metastable state. Of course, it's not an actual stable state because eventually we've got a finite population size. Eventually we run out of individuals. Um, you know, we exhaust the susceptibles, but um, we're going to take advantage of that metastability later on. Um, another important thing to say is if you look at the peak of the infectious curve as, as rho varies on here and as D varies here, you can see that initially increasing rho reduces um, uh, and delays the peak. So we bring it down. This is sort of um, squashing, the, squashing the curve, if you like. This is a mitigation strategy that was advocated in the UK. Um, but as we continue to increase rho, then eventually we get to a, a suppression strategy where the timing of the peak of infection moves backwards while the peak continues to get lower. Um, and a similar behavior can be observed for this proportion of distrusting individuals in the population in this plot as well. So these two um, behaviors indicate the existence of a phase transition, some critical threshold 
value for rho and or the density of distrusting individuals that divides the two regions, suppression and mitigation. Uh, and to see that more clearly, we've plotted um, we've plotted that on um, on a on a phase plane where we've gone the density of distrusting individuals goes between zero and one, and um, the the, um, the size of protective measures goes between um, zero and one here. So we can see more clearly these two regimes now. Um, the region marked with one corresponds to suppression. So this is the timing of the peak infection. So that should be lower and lower for, for better and better suppression. Um, the, um, the region marked with two, you can see corresponds to this mitigation regime where the reduction in transmission elicited by informed individuals isn't sufficient to contain the spread of the disease, only mitigate it instead. Um, and this might be due to either uh, failure to adhere to these non-pharmaceutical interventions or uh, the proportion of the population being sufficiently high. Note that there is a critical value of D for this, for this particular plot, it's somewhere around 0.7, for which when you have enough or high enough proportion of the population uh, being distrusting individuals, it doesn't matter how good your pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical interventions are, if no one's taking any notice of them, then you can't suppress the epidemic anymore. So there's this region where it doesn't matter what your value of rows, you can't suppress uh, the epidemic. So we did a little bit of theory to try and simplify the model, and I'm not going to go through all the detail on this, but effectively in the limit of fast information spread, you can eliminate a lot of the variables. The trusting population just goes down to being in state zero or in state one, um, and the distrusting individuals all go into state infinity in the limit of fast information spread. So you can boil that whole system that I showed you down to just these five uh, ordinary differential equations. And again, you can do some analysis with this, assuming that you've got this metastability of the, of the population so that the infectious population uh, isn't changing much over time. And then you can estimate the critical value uh, or the relationship between rho and D uh, the, the proportion of the population who are uh, actively seeking out disinformation. Uh, and here, so this is the formula, it's some quadratic formula. Again, don't worry too much about it. Um, but X here is one minus rho. Uh, so this is the relationship between rho and D. And so from that simplified set of equations, um, you can note that the, um, there's a critical density of this trusting population um, that I suggested a couple of slides back, given um, uh, this is this is the, the critical uh, uh, density dm, which is actually the inverse of the, uh, the basic reproduction number. So if the density is above this value, suppression of the disease isn't achievable for any value of rho. Um, the other thing to note is that for the positive uh, branch of this solution, the x plus, then um, the solution is always positive, which gives you a, a critical value of rho smaller than one. So that means that provided D is greater than DM, this critical value, there's always a suppression region of parameter space um, somewhere in there. Um, so you can always suppress provided you, you have uh, a sufficiently high value of rho uh, and, uh, and a low enough proportion of individuals that are uh, actively seeking disinformation. So again, this is just comparing the, the simulations with this. This is the peak epidemic time here. And um, we split it into those two regions. Again, the black dash curve is our theoretical uh, curve that I just showed you on the previous slide. And the blue curve is the numerical simulation results from the full model. Uh, and you can see they agree quite nicely. And again, this is what I'm saying. As long as DM, D is less than DM, the critical value, then there's some value of rho for which we can suppress the epidemic. All right, so just to summarize, I'm aware that I'm sort of getting close to time or maybe even over. So um, to summarize, I think past epidemiological models haven't accounted for some of these important aspects of behavioral response to disease in human populations. And I'm, I'll emphasize that we're not the first people to consider this sort of model of information spread. In fact, Sebastian, who's gonna be speaking after me is, is much more well-versed in this area. And we've probably stolen a lot of modeling ideas from his group, so a lot of credit should go to him. Um, I think the new thing we've probably brought to the table is the inclusion of a population of individuals who actively distrust information and seek out poorer quality information. Um, so we've developed a model in this work that has merged epidemiological dynamics with information spread and behavioral change interactions of both trusting and distrusting individuals in the population. And I think we've been able to highlight uh, the mechanisms by which the burdens of epidemic can be lightened. Um, I think 
our results show that awareness from behavioral changes can reduce the peak of infection and bring it earlier um, and increasing the size of the population that remains unaffected at the end of an epidemic so the final epidemic size can be reduced we've observed this phase transition between mitigation and suppression regimes for the disease uh, and that can be brought about by changing the transmissibility of the disease and uh, in this case that change is brought about by information spread impacting on transmission and we've derived a theoretical estimate for that phase transmission uh, sorry phase transition uh, in this particular model uh, and that one of the key results from the work is that there is a maximum proportion of distrusting individuals so if you keep gaslighting your population and telling them that masks aren't important for example then there's some degree after which people believe that and you can no longer suppress the epidemic so where are we going to go next with this well i'm aware that the model of information transmission that we use may not be the most realistic. There may be better models of, of uh, how information impacts on trans transmissibility. In particular, there are, we've assumed that information is spreading from person to person. That's a good assumption for disease spread, but it's maybe not a good, good model for information spread because we have non-local or even global sources as global sources of information, like the internet, for example. Um, which allow uh, information not just to spread from person to person, although there is definitely an important person to person word of mouth aspect to information spread. And we haven't included any space in here. It's a well mixed model. So, of course, including space, anything that you would like to do, which makes an SIR model better than an epidemiologic you know, in terms of modeling epidemiology, we could do with this at the, at the cost, of course, of making our models more complicated. So I'll finish by just throwing up the link and thanking the two people that I've worked with on this and uh, apologising for going over time and saying if you'd like to ask any questions, then I'd be delighted to try and answer them. Thanks. Thank you, Kit. That was excellent. So interesting as well. Um, I've, I can only see one question at the moment uh, from Giancs uh, Scagliato, I apologise if I've pronounced that wrong, uh, who says, in line with simplicity, wouldn't it be enough with just two cases, sorry, two classes equals T comma D, uh, if you understand what that means, Kit, but it's in the chat for your further uh, clarification. Yeah, let me have a look at the chat. In line with simplicity, wouldn't it be enough with just two classes? So, so. Um, instead of having different levels of information i assume rather than uh, rather than getting rid of si and r um yes ab absolutely uh, i think we uh, that's effectively what what we did when we had this rapid information uh spread i suppose the problem is that we were uh, our model is is in that sense is relatively nuanced in that we can uh, account for different degrees of information uh, information changes when you get infected potentially you get good information you believe that covid is real um but um then i think yeah i think we effectively did boil it down to just this case where you just have when information spread is fast then you do just effectively have these trusting individuals and distrusting individuals and that sort of very simplified model that we had and that was the model that actually allowed us to do some analysis because i think of course with a model as complex as the one that I showed before, we're limited to just doing numerical investigations, which of course can be useful, but it doesn't necessarily allow you to explore the whole of parameter space. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, Kit. Um, I can see Flavio has his hand up. Hi, Kit. That was that was super nice. Uh, it's, it's lovely to see, you know, in many of the mathematical epidemiology textbooks, there's a chapter on rumor models, but it's kind of treated as something different. And it's lovely to see how you merge those two things. Um, one thing that just occurred to me, especially if you go to networks, uh, to think about policy issues and, and, and actively try to, to combat misinformation, you can think of, you know, there, there are models in, in, in network economics that look at adversarial, um, you know, somebody trying to, 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 to destabilize the network and create bad outcomes, uh, and they may try to seed misinformation into the system. And so the question then becomes, how do you protect yourself against those things? Uh, where do you put your efforts? Do you want to use it on central nodes or peripheral nodes and all that kind of thing? So it seems to me that uh, you have built a very nice framework for looking at that kind of questions. Yeah, that's I and mean, it's a really interesting point. I think COVID has been, you know, COVID from a mathematical epidemiologist point of view, I think has probably been a very uh, useful thing to have happened. Obviously, it's, it's awful, um, the consequences, but 
we, we're seeing exactly that sort of thing happening. There are active disinformation networks out there. Uh, we know several in the UK and several who are incredibly influential and, and do have those hubs at their fingertips. You know, they actually have access to highly influential individuals, MPs, for example. Um, so, yeah, I, and I think you're right that the network structure then becomes incredibly uh, important in understanding this. But then, yeah, again, the other, the other side of it is that that there it's not just local transmission so yeah exactly the, the network structure where people are con connected uh via social networks um it becomes incredibly important so yeah i think that's really interesting to try and to to tackle um, um those sorts of misinformation or bad actors if you like bad fake actors yeah thanks thanks flavio and thanks kit um vincent um has his hand up and i think vincent this is probably what you posted in the chat Exactly, uh, but it's pretty much uh, uh, catching up on the or, or uh, attaching to that point. I, I think what people often do is they look for information that sort of confirms what they already know. So we position ourselves in echo chambers and, and uh, get more confirmed if we if we see information there. And I think that is probably quite crucial if you want to tackle misinformation. Uh, it, it's it's the dynamics between those groups. Have you got any any view how that could be incorporated or what it would do? It's a, it's a really good point and um, yeah, I'm all too aware that everyone suffers from confirmation bias, you know, myself in particular, I'm, I'm aware of that all the time when I'm on social media, um, but, but I mean perhaps more dangerous are the people that are not aware that they suffer from confirmation bias and only seek out this information. To some degree, there's an element of that incorporated in this model in that people are actively seeking out worse quality information, or rather they're actively seeking out information which, which agrees with, with their, their standpoint of being a distrusting individual. But no, we, we, know we haven't incorporated that reinforcing mechanism um, in an explicit way in the model, and um, I'm, sh yeah, I'm sure there are ways to do it. I, I haven't thought hard enough about how to do that, but it's a really important point. I think what would be interesting, what you probably would get, is a dynamic where one group would grow or shrink, and, and if we could get a handle on what the, what the shrinkage or the growth of these groups, uh, what determines that, how that's controlled, we might get some insights in how you could uh, control misinformation or steer the right sort of information. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think we'll, we know you'd see the growth of these these filter bubbles, if you like, and then occasionally their dramatic collapse a collapse when they, they pop. Uh, you know, people people who are you often hear these news stories on on news websites about uh, people who have been you know anti vaxxers or, or anti COVID didn't believe COVID was real and then got COVID and they're the most religious converts, the most zealous converts, uh, speaking out about how dangerous it can be. Um, yeah, they, I think that's that sort of transmission dynamics, that rise and fall, boom and bust, is, is a really interesting idea to, to model. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kit. And thank